So kitchens have a whole lot of functions and depending on the user that they can be different. So obviously one of the functions is food prep and cooking. You want to make sure that when you're designing your kitchen, obviously that's at the forefront of what you're thinking about when you're deciding what you're going to put in there. But today's kitchens are also family spaces. We lead such busy lifestyles that, you know, parents are running around dropping kids off at school. Um, we're commuting long distances for work. Well, we were before COVID and people are all over the place. So when you come and gather, it's often in the kitchen. So it really is a family gathering space as well. So when you design your kitchen, you need to keep that in mind if that's something you do there. We also entertain our kitchens, whether it's someone coming over for a cup of coffee or um, you're having a dinner party, we always start in our kitchen. So you want to think about designing a space that caters to that. And then finally, work, especially now with COVID, we've got more and more people working and from home and you might be working at the island bench, you might have kids doing homework at the island bench, or you might even integrate a little office space or a little um, built-in desk somewhere in your kitchen where either kids can work, you can work, or there can be the desktop to look things up when you need to ask Google something. So we really want to look at kitchens, look at your, when you're looking at your own space, to think about what functions do I want from my kitchen when you're designing your space? And what we're really talking about, today's kitchens are really multitasking spaces. They're not just a kitchen for food prep and cooking. They're a, kit, they're a space for lots of different activities. And so the key to achieving a multitasking kitchen is integration and organisation. And I actually had to look up um, integration online to see what it meant. And it actually means linking different components together, which I think really sums up integrating um, a multitasking kitchen or a kitchen that has lots of different spaces that work together. So integrating different parts of different areas where it's cooking, you've got your cleaning zones, you've got your storage zones, integrating all those together and then making them organised by putting them in the right place. So when we talk about integration, we're talking about basically everything in your kitchen, everything that you're putting in, all the drawers, all the um, shelves, all the open shelves. There's so many different systems that you can use and you actually, a really good kitchen has a combination of all of them. And depending on your needs, you might have more drawers because you love drawers or more shelves but you really need all those different solutions for a really functional kitchen. Um, drawers are obviously fabulous because you can pull open the whole drawer and see everything at once in a drawer, um, as opposed to shelves where things can get sort of lost at the back. So, you know, if you've got a smaller kitchen, drawers are a really good solution because you can access everything at the back. You can really fill up that hole all the way to the back of your um, Open shelves are fantastic because for two reasons. One, they personalise the kitchen because that's where you can put all your bits and pieces, cookbooks, whether it's, you know, art, little ceramics, you can put all that on an open shelf. But also in kitchen design, open shelves are great because they break up a kitchen. So you've got lots of flat doors, a little shelf with some um, items actually adds depth to your kitchen. So shelves are really, open shelves are really important. Obviously cupboards. And when we talk about cupboards, we also talk about doors because a cupboard is no longer just a hinge door. There's lots and lots of solutions and we'll look at some of those in a little, in a minute. But basically, there's, think about what kind of door system you want when you are installing a cupboard, whether you want the door to disappear like a pocket door or whether you want a bifold door or any other solution. And there's also, um, and when you're talking about those sorts of doors, you also need to think about whether you're going to be installing handles or whether you're going to be installing a push to open or push to close door. And then we talk about solutions. So part of storage is solutions inside our drawers. And that's what really makes our kitchens organized. If you've got cutlery trays in a drawer, it's so much more organized. You imagine just the cutlery all flying around in a drawer. So solutions like cutlery drawers, especially in a smaller kitchen, um, solutions for your plates and things like that and solutions like bins like a double bin or you can get bins that have four compartments I mean how many people have gone into a home or have had a home and you've got the recycling sitting on top of the bench and because you know someone hasn't taken it out if that's 
that's an unorganized, that's a kitchen that could be easily clean, tidy, that it's just not even something you have to worry about. So organizing your kitchen through solutions like integrated bins, literally you, you just wouldn't go back once you've got one. And then in, when we're talking about storage, we also talk about uh, thinking about whether you want to go soft close because a soft close drawer basically doesn't slam. When you push to close it, it slows down at the end and it closes on its own. So when you um, integrate soft closed drawers, it, you also generally have soft, you, soft closed hinges. If you specify soft closed drawers to your um, cabinet maker, soft drawers, soft closed hinges come hand in hand with that. So the same thing, you can just close a, a cupboard, just closes on its own, you just push it. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive and really great because you don't have the slamming impact, you don't have things moving around in your drawers as much and just a really good investment. So when we talk about integrated storage, we're talking about where should I put this storage? And the place to put it is right where you're working, right into the heart of your kitchen. And that's the good thing about, because really if you think about you're in your kitchen, you're working, you really want everything there. But sometimes smaller kitchens are actually much better if they're well well designed than a larger kitchen because you really don't have to be running around everywhere. So you really want to integrate your storage right where you want it and that's when you use your door solutions, different types of doors, your drawers, your cupboard doors or wing line doors which I'll talk about in a minute so that you can have everything right where you want it within reach but then out of sight you can hide it when it's not in use and that's the ideal solution in today's kitchens where we're talking about kitchens that function for entertaining, kitchens that function for family spaces, kitchen when you're cooking, when you're cooking you just want everything open, you don't want to be opening cupboards and doors and so that's why solutions where you integrate and ha can have a door that can be open and flexible is a really good solution. Everything can be hidden out of sight so it's functional when it's open and then when you're entertaining everything can be closed. So when we talk about kitchens now, I think if you look at any magazine or anywhere you look, today's kitchens really replicate furniture or resemble furniture. It's, we're no longer looking at just a kitchen that's a room tucked away in the back of the house where most of us are living in or designing open plan homes or even if we're renovating an older home, sometimes we're pulling down walls to open up the space. So we really want to design our kitchens so that we can, we can hide everything away when we're not using it. And there's a few ways we can do that. And I'm gonna show you um, a folding door system, which is basically a bifold door. And that's one way you can really easily hide away everything right in the heart of your kitchen. So I'm just gonna show you a little video. Um, to work. No volume. Oh, we lost. Sorry. Um, <coughs> oh, where does it? Where is that? Oh, yes. Uh, maybe it's muted there. This is speakers. Oh, here we go. Maybe that was it. Okay. Thank you. When it comes to kitchen design, functionality is key and one of the most important ingredients is ample storage. The storage that's unplanned and in the wrong place will have you doing a workout from one end of your kitchen to the other. So it's essential for storage like a pantry or appliance cupboard to be flexible and located right in the heart of your kitchen, yet easily hidden out of sight when not in use. And the perfect way to achieve this is with a heavy folding door system or bifold door. Here we use the heavy wing line L folding door. It's the perfect solution for integrating storage for your most practical items right where you need them. With the flexibility to conceal everything behind seamless cabinetry doors when not in use. Opening and closing the heavy wing line L is done with one quick hand movement. The push pull mechanism means there's little muscle required to open the door making pulling open heavy doors a thing of the past. It can even accommodate large doors up to 2.4 metres high and heavy door rings weighing up to 
25 kilos. These heavy carrying doors can be installed with handles, but for handleless use. And because they're soft opening and closing, they run like a dream with no slamming impact. It's really the solution that allows you to hide all clutter and create a fully integrated kitchen. When the heavy wing line is closed, you don't even know it's there. It can be integrated seamlessly into your kitchen with your appliances, like an integrated fridge, and no one's the wiser. And better still, the Hetic Wing Line Elf even has the flexibility to double up. So you can create a large open storage solution right in the heart of your kitchen with a double folding door system that slides effortlessly either way, absolutely customized to suit your needs. And you don't have to stop in the kitchen. A folding door system can transform storage in your new laundry, laundry, linen cupboard or office to create clever hidden storage everywhere throughout your home. So if you're looking to create a functional, practical and seamless kitchen design, look no further than a folding door system like the Hetic Wingline Tower. Go back to our screen. Sorry, guys. Okay, so there you saw a type of door system that you can use to integrate um, a larger storage solution in your home. So especially if you would like the convenience of a butler's pantry or a scullery or something that's a bigger storage solution and you don't have the space, this kind of system is really good for a smaller kitchen. Although you can use it anywhere. I've got one in my home, which actually in the kitchen hides um, hides a study or a, an office desk. So everything, if you open that up, you really don't want to. It's full of you know paperwork and things like that. But when it's closed, it just looks like cabinetry in the kitchen. So it's a really good solution for integrating anything like that. Um, actually, whilst we're on the topic of sculleries and butler's pantries, I just wanted to say, if you are designing a kitchen and this is on the agenda, this is a really, this is an area that we, we often get wrong. And that's because we end up with two kitchens. So be really mindful if you are designing a house with a home or a kitchen with the butler's pantry, it is a second kitchen. If you put a sink in there, you need a bin, you might need a dishwasher, you might want one. But if you're doing a lot of things in there, you might want cutlery in there. You might want those sorts of things. So it's really important with the scullery that it's really close and really well connected to your kitchen. And if you've got the space and it's not that big, you might be actually better off making your um, butler's pantry more of a pantry so it's real it's got lots of storage you might have a couple of appliances on the bench top and then make it very close and very central to your actual sink so that you can act, have really good access to your sink if you've got a kettle in there you can fill it up but then you don't you save the expense of another sink another bin walking back and forth you know you can just keep you can keep a bit of a mess in there sometimes and close the door if you want to. But just something to be really careful with if you are designing a home with that extra butler's pantry or scullery that you don't end up with two kitchens and just walking back and forth because you've got bins and everything else. Yeah. I'm just going on the same thing. So what would be um, like the distance? Like, I mean, I have a lovely one where you would have filled in to resell. So, yeah. And the sink was like literally two and a half metres apart yeah. But so they did the next house without one. Yeah. Where's the sink? Where is that? So what? What is like? Uh, well, it's not actually the distance from one sink to the other isn't really an issue. You can have them close together. It's more how, like, if you do have only the one sink, how far the butler's pantry is away from it. Because if you're if you if you've got sorry if you've just got a pantry without the sink and everything, if it's more of a pantry. Um, then a walk-in pantry and you've got your kettle there, you don't want to be walking six or seven metres to your um, 
to your sink and also to your dishwasher that's going to be with your sink to put away a teaspoon. So it's more, the two sinks can be close together and a butler's pantry or a scullery with a sink that's close to the kitchen is not a bad thing. I mean, because the idea is a second workspace, but not a second kitchen. So it's really important to make sure they're connected. And even, you know, you might have, like if you've got one fridge, you might position your fridge between the two. So it services both because you, you don't want to have your fridge down one end, then your kitchen and then your butler's pantry and just the one fridge. So you just got to take all these things into consideration. You know, what do you actually need? Butler's pantry is great. If, if you entertain and you've got someone doing the cooking all the time, it's fabulous. You can close the door, but we really, you know, we all do our own cooking really. So um, it's really, really something, a real downfall that you find in homes where you end up with two kitchens. Really just make sure those spaces are connected. Mm -hmm. If you had a prep uh, sink in the kitchen and the kitchen is, uh, sorry, butler's right behind the kitchen. So you give a proper sink in the butler's. Absolutely. With the dishwasher and everything yeah. in the butler's while yeah. you just have and, that, and that's, that's, that's a great solution. And then that's probably your working kitchen. And this is more your show kitchen. But you still have that, um, you'll still be, if you think about it, still be walking with like, you clear up your plates, you're still taking everything out the back. And then you have to think about where you're unloading. So you've got that dishwasher in the, if you've just got the one dishwasher and it's in your butler's pantry, then where are those plates going? Are they going in the butler's pantry or are they going into the kitchen? Because when you're setting the table, you'll be setting from ideally from the kitchen or very close. It's all about that flow and it's all about, and every home and every floor plan will be different. So it's more about thinking about, well, where do I, where do I want to wash up? And then where do I want to unpack? So if I'm unpacking that, I'm going to talk about that in a minute when I talk about location of places, but so think about everything will need to go in there. So there's no right or wrong answer. It's more about making them connected and the flow really good between the flow excellent between the two spaces. And, you know, you can have a sliding door, but ideally if you can open up your butler's, butler's pantry and make it almost like one big kitchen, part of your kitchen, I think that's the ideal solution. And then obviously just any items like fridges that you've only got one of, keeping those central between the two so they can service both. So, um, um, and talking about storage that replicates furniture, Aventec U, the Aventec U drawer system is a brand new drawer that has just been released by Hedic. Um, they've got their showroom. They're going to have a display here at the Build Centre. I think it's next month it'll be opening. Um, so I'm sure that'll be on display. And this is really the cutting edge if you want drawers that look like furniture or if you're doing something special and you might not use them everywhere, but you might want to do, you might want to do some built-in cabinetry in your living area that um, blend, that sort of has the same finishes or similar finishes to your kitchen. And these drawers, when you open them, you don't see any of the fixings, but they also made to um, carry the weight of stone, of all these sorts of things, all those fittings. So if you want a stone front, if you want glass, if you want some special detail, it's, they have um, beautiful um, finish on the sides as well that can complement and accessorize to brass fittings. You can have brass sides, you might have an all white kitchen and then have brass handles and then have a have you know the color of the brass on the side so they're just all these little features that make a home and you can choose you you know when you when you're designing your kitchen there's lots of choices in terms of what you're going to choose so knowing about this coming to somewhere like the building and design center where you can see everything at the same time and look at pay attention to these things what does this drawer look like what is this drawer or with cabinetry or with tapware and, and what do i like about it you know when you're choosing um different um, finishes and materials for your home so I'm going to also talk, when we talk about integration, we obviously also talk about appliances. Um, in our kitchens, we obviously integral to, integral to our kitchens, having really good appliances and then to be functional and right, right in the heart of our kitchens within our working triangle. So the working triangle is basically the fridge, the sink and the stove. You want all those three to be in a sort of triangle. It doesn't have to be perfect, but those are the three areas that you you pretty much flow between. And then from that working triangle, you want to be integrating within easy reach most of your storage. That's basically the key to a functional kitchen. Working triangle and then the majority of your storage that you use every day within hands reach or very close to that working triangle. So when we talk about integrated appliances, I love integrated appliances because 
don't know about you guys, but when I was young, we had a range hood that was like a canopy and it had all the dust and that was one of my jobs, I had to clean the dust off it. And when I discovered um, integrated range hood, I thought they were like magic because you don't have to do that. Basically, you've just got cupboards and it integrates with your cupboards. Um, and then obviously we still have to clean the filter of your range hood. But integrated appliances really are also the key to creating that functional kitchen, the, the kitchen that functions as, as lots of different spaces because the functional aspects of your kitchen are sort of hidden. So, you know, we, we see the pretty um, beautiful um, cabinetry, we see um, the beautiful handles and the finishes, and then the practical components are sort of hidden. So if you've got a space you, you can entertain in, you know, everything looks like furniture, everything looks like cabinetry. Um, also, the big, big positive of integrated appliances is cleaning, as I said, with the range hood, but also with your cooktop, um, as you can see here, the um, cooktop and then also the oven, like there are, you know, the old school, well, I mean, there's still some beautiful ones these days, but the oven that just basically slid in between your cabinets and you've got dust collecting underneath. You've got, um, you know, you can, it's not integrated. You've got no kick underneath. With an integrated appliance like an oven, everything, there's no cleaning except for the oven. That's all, you've still got to do that. But everything else, your kick just runs all the way along your kitchen in your, um, in your design and everything's integrated. And then obviously you can integrate microwaves too. I've often wondered about cabinetry when it's built to fit something. Yep. I think down the track, what happens if something breaks, like the fridge dies? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, you're, they basically pretty much stay the same size because the manufacturer wants you to buy, go buy another one the same anyway. So they don't really change. And you actually see that a lot of ovens are very similar dimensions as well. So I'm not saying everyone, every oven's guaranteed to be replaced, but generally... Bridges. Yeah, especially if you sell and then someone else buys and then they've got... A For an integrated fridge, you mean, or...? Yeah, like when you're designing a, a kitchen yep. and you're trying to think ahead, if I sell this property, yep. what is the best, you know, space to put in... Absolutely. Yes, yeah. that's a great question. So the option is if you still want to have that beautiful kitchen and have everything hidden but you don't want an integrated fridge is to design your kitchen so it's not seen sorry design your kitchen so your fridge isn't seen maybe pop it around the side maybe you can design your kitchen so you've got sort of like you know it, it's got sort of an l bend to it and then you've got some pantry or storage down the side and the fridge can be hidden behind there then you can have a big space to slide in any fridge and you, you won't see it so that's definitely um, an option in terms of, if you're thinking about on sale, and you know, when you're designing your kitchen, every kitchen's different, everyone's needs are different, and you're never going to meet every buyer's needs either. So you've really got to think about practicality. I always, when I design homes, think about 80% of the market, 80% of people coming into the home and not being offended about having all their needs met and ideally putting something in that they're not expecting. So, you know, depending on where you're, bar where you're building or renovating, think about something that people won't expect. That's a real draw card for your home. Um, I'll talk about fridges as well a bit more. So the benefits of an integrated fridge is that obviously it's seamless in your kitchen. You don't see it, you don't know where it is but also it's got a much smaller footprint than a, than a regular fridge. So if you've got a really small kitchen, an integrated fridge is perfect because it doesn't also take up the depth. Like 600 to 650 deep is basically, 600 is your um, average or the standard height depth for your cabinetry, your bench tops. Your fridge pretty much fits into the same space or just a little bit more. So you've got that flush line. So if you don't have a lot of a very big footprint, um, this can make the difference between you having a proper island bench or not in a smaller home. Um, obviously cleaning, you don't have any of those gaps or anything else. And no matter what fridge you buy, if it's not integrated, you, it, you, you'll you end up, you have, it sits forward. So it's something to consider. So, you know, when you are designing your kitchen, think about what fridge you're going to put in beforehand, because you want to make sure you've got enough depth for them. Because some of the big fridges, not integrated ones, some of the big fridges are about seven or 800 deep these days and tall as taller as well. Um, 
And then, um, so you want to design your, your, your space to be, your cavity to be as narrow as possible, but bear in mind, you will, your fridge will need to sit forward of that gap because for the doors to swing, they don't swing it with an integrated fridge, doors swing on themselves. A regular fridge, they sort of swing out. So you, do, you you'll have to sit your fridge forward a little bit. So um, location, this is so important for an organized kitchen because you can have all these amazing, um, amazing solutions in your kitchen, but everything could be in the wrong place and you're just walking around back and forth, you know, walking between one section to the other. Um, your sink is obviously really important. And people always ask, where, you know, should I put it on the island bench or should I put it, you know, on the bench, um, just on the cooktop front or another on the wall? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's what suits you. If, if you don't want it on the island bench, don't put, put it there. And someone will come into a home and want the complete opposite. You're, you're never going to tick everyone's box. You just put it where it suits you. There's nothing wrong with having a sink on an island bench. I love a sink on an island bench because I think it's such a high use item. You can always have a single sink there if you prefer. But if you are putting a sink on an island bench, just make sure you've got some depth on your island bench. So a standard bench top, an island bench is 900 mil deep. So that allows for your kitchen and another 300 mil. I always go more than that because if someone's sitting at the bench, they're almost sitting, they're only sitting 30 centimetres away from your, your tap. So make sure if you are putting a sink on a bench, if you have the space, make your bench just that bit, bit deeper. Even a metre is a big difference and you can go up to 1.2 metres or more. Um, in terms of your sink location, you want your sink to be really central because you've got the working triangle with your fridge, your sink and your stove or your cooktop, but your, your sink is actually where you, 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 you're at the most. You know, usually working around there at the bench top near your sink and then you're going between the two. So really make your sink central to your kitchen and then have good access to all the other areas like we were talking about before. If you've got a little pantry where you're planning to or an appliance cupboard, it needs to have good access to that, those sorts of areas. And then at your sink is where you want to have your bin and your dishwasher side by side. You're doing that um, cleaning prep, you're scraping plates, you're putting them in the dishwasher, you're clearing up, you're washing up. Um, it's just those three items, those three um, areas need to be always together. Um, and then we talked about it a bit before about the dishwasher and to make sure it's really central to storage like your cutlery tra trays or your cutlery drawers to um, where you're storing your plates, your mugs, all those things. You're unpacking your dishwasher every single day, even if you just, even if there's not many people at home. So um, really think about um, making sure those areas that you're constantly unloading, your mugs, your glasses are really close so you're not walking to the other side of your kitchen. Um, something I didn't really talk about before, but I want to touch on as well is when you are choosing your appliances and, and things like that, and you are designing and you're trying to, that's right at the beginning of your kitchen design journey, choosing your appliances. You can't really do anything before you've done that. Think about yourself and your lifestyle and what you need, because I don't know if you've ever been in a bigger home where they've got a really flash kitchen, they've often got two, two ovens, but there's generally not two dishwashers. And I know what I use every day. I've got two dishwashers. There's always one that's full and going. The other one's half full. And that's another way that you can organize your kitchen because you don't have like a pile of dishes on the bench because the dishwasher's running and it's full. They just go straight into the other one. And I, we use our dishwasher, but two kids, we use both our dishwashers every single day. So um, really consider what you need, what's right for you. I mean, and what's right for you is generally what's right for other people as well. Even, and depending on whether you're designing your house for yourself, it might be a bit different if you're designing to sell, but really consider that even for your buyers, whether they might want one oven and two dishwashers or, you know, what the preference is. Um, other inclusions in our kitchens that are really important is lighting. Obviously, a kitchen that's well designed has to be lit well at night as well. So I love integrating my kitchen's LED strip lighting into the underside of the overhead. So it's basically just sits underneath where the range hood is behind there. And that is excellent lighting at night. That actually light, LED strip lighting is so strong. You actually don't need a lot more lighting if you're just working in one area. Um, 
It's task lighting, so it shines straight down onto the surface where you're working. It's excellent lighting. And then obviously you want to um, integrate other types of lighting with that. You might want to integrate lighting because it, it's an entertaining space and a space that you're um, hosting family or just gathering. You might want to include some soft lighting because sometimes at night you might be chatting or something. So you might want to have some nice warm lights or put in some lighting that's actually a little bit less functional, but more practical, sorry, a little bit less practical, but more aesthetic. So think about those sorts of lights that you might also put in because you've got a cabinetry that sort of looks like furniture. So you want to light it up at night and make it look beautiful. And then obviously down lights. Kitchens are actually spaces where down lights are really good because you're shining straight down onto the surface that you want. So that's what down, down lights is the perfect lighting when you want light to be straight down onto a surface. So, and you can, if you want to make your lighting a little bit nicer, you can use um, surface mounted down lights. If you, you, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money, but want something that's just that little bit more, um, has that designer look, surface mounted are great. And then obviously inclusions in a kitchen, bench, like an island bench, it's probably like what we, re we, every kitchen needs an island bench, I think. Even a tiny island bench, but a space for someone to sit, for kids to sit as they're talking to you or doing homework if they actually talk to you, but um, a place to sit and talk to people. And um, it really makes a space, like even an, a small kitchen with an island bench then creates that whole functionality of a gathering space, of a family space and an entertaining space. Um, in terms of island benches, we also have the option to integrate a dining table on the end. Um, which is a really good solution for small or larger homes. You know, if you've got a very small home, you might be able to do away with the dining table by incorporating that into the, the end of your island bench. If you have a lot of seamless integrated cabinetry, it can just look like a dining space. So, um, so what's your kitchen design process when you're planning to start your new kitchen? The first thing you need to do is research. That's all you need to do at the beginning. You need to look at as much as you can Somewhere like the Build and Design Centre obviously is great because you can also take away samples um, of, you know, cabinetry and things like that. And you can even walk around with them and put them, you know, you found a laminate that you like or, you know, a colour, you can put it next to a tap and see how they look. Um, but that's your, the beginning of your research, of your kitchen design journey. You need, ideally, you start something like a mood board. So that can be like, there's a lot of free tools online where you can just literally copy and paste things in and it's, it literally doesn't take very long. You like that and then you remember what you liked and what it was. Um, and you can also just get a scrapbook and cut out pieces, but really do that at the beginning because what that does is give you a picture of what your kitchen light will look like. And then you might go, you know, might be doing that for a number of weeks or months and you might pull things out and go, and then you can have a look and go, actually all this fits together. So that's the beginning where you sort of visualize your kitchen and what it's going to look like. Then you go into the planning st stage where you really start planning what you want in. And the first thing you need to decide is tapware, plumbing and appliances basically, because you can't really plan your kitchen until you know what, what kind of fridge you're having or you know whether you've got one or two dishwashers or how many sinks. So you really, your planning starts with that and then making sure, we talked about the working triangle, making sure you've got that triangle of fridge, stove and um, sink so that they're all together and then design your cabinetry around that. So have those areas locked in first. Your microwave doesn't really matter where it goes unless you use it all the time. If like most people just use their microwaves to heat something up or to cook something, but you put it in and you walk away. It's not something you're going back and forth to like your cooktop, like your fridge and like your sink. So your microwave could be in a scullery, your microwave could be in a cupboard as long as you've got enough ventilation, could be anywhere that suits or works in your kitchen. And then once you've got all that planned and you might be working with a cabinet maker, they might be designing your kitchen for you. And if that's the case in that plan you've done, you should be doing your research first so you know what you want, you know what to ask for, you know you've looked at drawers, you've looked at fridges, you know what you want because they'll want to know, your cabinet maker will want to know what fridge have you got. Um, then have a look at your plans and make sure the solutions, the storage solutions that you need are there. Make sure you've got drawers, you know, and have, and this is a really good time before you finalize your cabinetry and during the planning stage to look at your kitchen that you're in now and have a look and go, 
okay, well, there's a pile of stuff over there. Why is that stuff there? Do I just need to do a Marie Kondo? Or is it because there's no storage in my kitchen? So decide what storage is lacking, what drawers are full, what, what's missing in your kitchen, and then make sure that's in your new kitchen. You know, a beautiful kitchen is great, but if it's not functional, if you don't have the storage that you need, it's, you're not going to love working in it. You're not going to want to cook. You're not gonna, what, going to want to entertain in there. And then finally, obviously, we get to the building stage. And at that stage, you want to have everything locked in as much as you can, especially, well, whether you're building or renovating. Because if you're building, you'll need to know the location <coughs> of your sink. You'll need to know all those sorts of things before you start. And then if you're renovating, it can be more stressful because you, you might be living in the home. You might need to make decisions. You never know what's, what's, what you're going to uncover when you pull down a wall. So you want to have as many things locked in so you don't have to stress about, oh, wait a minute, which oven am I doing? What am I putting in? Because, you know, they've already pulled the kitchen out and like having to make, lock all that in beforehand and it'll be so much more stress-free for you. Um, and that's the best way to approach any build or any renovation. So as I mentioned before, HEDIC have got their display that will be opening up next <clears> month. And if you're looking at organisation solutions, that's going to be a really good place to start just to work out what you want for your kitchen. Um, and this whole centre is actually, I don't know if you, I, I remember I came here about 10 or 15 years ago the first time, and now I've been coming here almost every year and it's just getting better and better. So it really is a good place to start if you just want to have a look and start researching and just get some ideas. So thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, and thank you, Hedick, for um, allowing me to come and um, do this today and share some of my kitchen tips with you. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, we've got a website um, and all the details are there. Um, got an online blog where I share lots of other tips for everything in the home, from design, from floor plans, um, colour schemes and everything else. So um, if you've got any questions, you might they might be answered on the blog. Yes. Uh, just a comment about the building and design centre. My yep. kitchen is about to start on the 10th of November, so That's I should see it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty happy with the design. Great. Um, the building and design centre I have used over the years a lot. But uh, it's a pity that not every stand has got person manual. Right. Because it's all very well to see the product. Yes. So we've all got lots of questions about yep. where things are going to fit. Can you get it in that? Um, Paroma, for example, I'm using some Paroma stuff. Yeah. Um, my hand basins in the bathroom. Um, amazingly, there is no person manning that stand at any stage of the game. I don't think right. the Brisbane markets are important enough. Uh, on the other hand, the YPLs, they have a person there and they were fantastic. Oh, it makes um, a big difference. Yeah, if you, want, you want to ask those questions. So that's some important feedback. Yeah, that's good feedback. Yep. Um, the other two questions I have, can you spend a couple of minutes on door handles? Sure. Yeah. And also under mount versus top mount versus inset. Sure. But absolutely. I'm not really organizing about all those things. <laughs> no, definitely. So in terms of handles, what is there anything in particular? Uh, well, the width of the, the drawer is going to be 900. Yep. Which is a bloody big drawer. Yes. Uh, the size of the handle. I yep. don't want soft clothes. I wanted something which is going to be minimally visible. Sure. Um, sure. There's lots and lots of options available. Yep. There's no what the, the length of that handle is going to be. So uh, with, with a really wide drawer. Plus, I've, I've got a really big uh, cupboard which has got for, for storing everything and it's got yeah. like a hinge to it. Sure. So if you choose something for the vertical spaces, how do you match or what do you use to match the, the no, if you choose something for the horizontal spaces, what do you sure. use for the vertical spaces? Yeah, that's a really good All question. those kind of things, which, which it's that nitty gritty which I really wanted to lock down. And get it before. right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's visual. Yeah, it? it's more visual. Oh, absolutely. It's visual, visual and it's functional. So you're, you're Cabinet handles don't have to be matched and be exactly the same. They definitely need to be the same colour. Um, ideally, they do match though. So you might be able to use a smaller handle for a drawer and a larger for a door. There's no rules actually to like, okay, if your drawer's 900, you know, I've got 1200 wide drawers in my home. There's no rule, but you do want to make sure it's, um, it, it's balanced. So obviously go a little bit wider. You can sort of go one third to, two-fifths in terms of width, but it really is more aesthetic. You I mean, you could have a tiny little handle on a large drawer because that's the look of your kitchen. So I'd be more thinking about looking at a pic, if you've got a picture that you love of a kitchen, so 
saying, well, what does that kitchen look like? Does it, are the handles really minimal or are they a feature? And that's another way to decide what size handles you're putting on something. Do you want it to be a feature? Do you want, you know, are you spending some money on beautiful handles or do you want it to be just a little bit functional? And then obviously when you're choosing handles um, to be ma to make sure that they, they are functional, so that they've got a good grip. So, because there's nothing worse than trying to open a cupboard door and you can't, you know, you've got to use your little fingertips because you've got a tiny handle. So a larger handle's probably got, going to have better grip and be easier to use. And there's, you can definitely, if you're looking at drawers and then drawers, horizontal for your drawers and vertical for your drawers is perfectly fine and functional. And as long as they're the same, they match. So it's about using the same finishes in the space um, rather than, you know, having to have them looking exactly the same and on the same plane. Um, sinks. Under sinks. Under what do you want? Basically. Well, you, you've, got to look, you've got to be practical. And yeah. I'm led to believe that the undermount has a cleaning issue. Sure. It looks great in no. the photo, but what looks great in the photo is not always practical. No, undermount actually don't have a cleaning issue. Okay. The modern undermount sink. If you're looking for an undermount sink, things to look for. Actually, and most things these days, like even in the last five years, have come such a long way, they've got a really tiny minimal lip. So um, I might see if I can find a photo for you in a minute. But basically, the lip is so minimal that even if you drop it in, it's, it's, very, it's almost, it, it's almost looks integrated, but you will still have that build up of product. A drop in sink is going to give you a lot more cleaning issues than an undermount sink. And but you want to make sure your undermount sink has rounded corners because you don't there's, and there's not many anymore, but they, when they first came out, they had like square corners and you couldn't even get in there to clean. So I always go an undermount sink in the kitchen because coming back to your kitchen being like furniture and um, your kitchen being a place where you're entertaining, I want to have clean lines. I want everything to be minimal. I, I want it to be functional, but also as seamless as possible. So in my kitchen, I always undermount. In the laundry, not as much of an issue you can drop in because you're not using your laundry sink 10 times a day. So even if, if the food, all the, all the, everything doesn't build up as much because it's just not getting used as much. And it's also a saving because an undermount sink will cost you about $220 or about $250 just because the stone has to be polished as opposed to them just cutting out a hole in your stone and dropping it in. So, and then in terms of inset, well, that's more um, basically what, you know, the look that you're after. So I, I'd always go and undermount for cleaning and for aesthetics. On, on that subject, um, can you actually, like there's some products that you have can't put in dishwashers, so you actually have to have them hand washed and yeah. wrap them. Yeah. Can you actually, with an undermount sink, use your bench to like put a wrap? Yeah, well, so so you, you either, there's a few options. You can actually have um, routed out channels in your stone that sort of angle down. There is undermount sinks. A lot of undermount sinks have um, accessories available. So you can buy a drain that sits on, like you might have a double sink. One of them, you can, you can pull it off and just use two sinks. Or you can put it on, or you can put a tray. Like I actually have a tray in my sink at home. So I've, I use one and then I've got a tray sitting in the other one but it's in a skull, like in a scullery. So it's not in the main kitchen. So it just, you know, so that, that's, you know, functionality wise. And you can pull that out and put it in the cupboard when you're not using it. But you do, or, you know, you can put a tea towel on the bench and okay. leave things to drip. It just depends on how many things you're washing, but there is a lot of options um, if you want to have that look and no strange. You mentioned three types of three things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to crop in the next one. Insects. Insects. So, it's just the one that actually sits on the surface. Drop in, like right. a drop What's in. It's, it's sort of set into the, like, it's hard to go. I'm not very good at explaining it when, but it's basically sort of set in within the, the bench top. It's, uh, there's not as many, it's, you get a lot more inset. You get a lot more inset. Um, have you seen the, um, the um, yeah, it's sort of like, it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of in between. It's probably sits a bit higher than a bench top, but do you, can you visualize that? Like you probably more the white ones that you see the Hampton style, yeah. they're sort of more like an inset basin. Yeah. So it's more a particular style that you're probably using an inset basin, not the standard sort of stainless steel or black sink. Um, yeah. I'm using
meetings sent to my bathroom because I've got space issues. Right. I can't have too deep a um, bench. So the inset to me, uh, it only sticks out that little bit. I couldn't have come down. I just didn't have, I couldn't yeah. have used it. Right? So it, it and it does look cool. quite seamless. So, I mean, in your kitchen, it's obviously more a look you're going for when you go for an inset. In your bathroom, if you want to have a top mount, but so the so once again, like you know, if you've got two or three bathrooms you're renovating and you want to save some money, you can do drop in or inset bases, and then the stone just needs to be cut out because you don't have to pay two hundred and fifty dollars for every cutout to be polished. So or you, and you might just like that look. So it's just um, it's a saving, and it also it still looks quite seamless because you you might have a lip about that high. So it's more common in bathrooms than kitchens, but the Hamptons. Um, style has made it more popular as well. Could we talk a bit about kicks? So yeah. I always like minimal kicks, but the cabinet makers always advise me against that. Yeah. So um, generally speaking, it would be 100 to 150. Yep. Um, I just noticed that you have a kitchen there without the kick. So is that all right? Like, so that does have a kick? Like this side, I thought the Oh, it does. Yeah, oh, yes, it, does. it does. It does. But um, not on the bench. The bench goes down to the floor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but you don't. I mean, it's basically whatever you want it to be. You, the kick is made so that you don't. You're not hitting the drawer because you're standing. When you're standing up at a sink or anything, you want to be close to it. So your feet usually just go under the bench. Um, and also, you want to be able to get your vacuum cleaner in under there without. So, but usually about eighty. I usually go about eighty to a hundred mil. So you can specify whatever you want, and then obviously you'll have to live with the circumstance of whether you know it's a problem or not. But that's basically it's for your foot. It's a kick because you don't want to take your cabinetry down because you know you'll be hitting it with a vacuum cleaner. It's, it's wear and tear. So it's more about those two things rather than anything else. And then in other parts of your home, like wardrobes and things like that, I sometimes take the kick a lot smaller. And if you've got a door, you can still get in there to vacuum and things like that. But there's no rules with those sorts of things. It's just more um, what you want and what you're willing to live with as well. Is that measurement depth or height? So height. Height. Mm -hmm. height. And depth it just varies depending on the look you're after, where you really want it to look like it's floating or whether, you know, sort of you want to go standard. So it's, yeah, it, it really is. But 150 mil, you don't, is definitely not. Like 100 mil would be probably the max I'd go unless there was a reason. So the only other thing to consider then is um, like in, on things like your, if you're going a thicker bench top and then um, that's going to affect things like your dishwasher and things like that. Although that kick usually can come up a little bit higher as well if you're integrating those areas. So, you know, your dishwasher needs a certain height. So it might dictate things like bench tops and things like that. So, but you can always go up a little bit with your bench top up to about 9.30 or 9.40 or a bit above standard. So, yeah. Also, with um, the working triangle, if you had to compromise on the triangle itself and go three in line, kind of, yeah. just because um, you do not want a sink on the bench top. Um, so you have all on the one wall? So two on the cooktop and the, uh, and the sink yep. on the back counter. Yep. And you perpendicular to that with the bridge. Well, that's, that's still within a triangle. So that's what a, tri a triangle can go. It can be a weird shape, yeah, okay. but it's all still within that same zone. And then just think about the location of things. You know, really probably, what, what, what are you at the most? Probably our sinks, because we wash up, we you know, wash food, then we wash plates. So you, that's probably good to be sort of central between the two. Your fridge, you use, but not as much. I mean, you go and grab something, but your, free, your sink you just keep coming back to. Um, so yeah, just think about, but yeah, it doesn't have to be a perfect triangle. You can have two items on the same plane, on the same wall, and then the other one perpendicular, and that's fine. That still counts as a triangle. So you've got the working triangle. <laughs> <laughs> a right angle one. Yep, exactly. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and it just depends on your um, kitchen as well. Um, and that, that more comes down to design and budget, you know, and if you don't want to spend the money on a waterfall, because it, it's not like, you know, who's got the biggest budget, gets the best kitchen or anything else. It's, you can have an amazing kitchen on a smaller budget by just, you know, thinking about how things work together, about having different depths on things. Like I always do shadow lines, which is basically, um, yeah, like a little line. That goes. So that's actually a 40 mil stone bench top. 
and that's laminate down the side. So it's not actually stone. So it's a cheap, but it's also because that um, that's a polytech cabinetry that has um, a profile on it. So I also wanted to replicate that on the side bench. But you don't have to do that. You can actually do that if you are doing that. I probably like if you want it to look a little bit more expensive and nicer, going 40 mil. So then you're probably putting 40 mil on your bench top with your stone, um, and then you can do that there. I don't know. It just seems a bit skewed, but might be my angle. Um, so yeah, you don't, you know, it all depends on the kitchen. And we've got so many round bench tops these days. I think, did I show one of our, um, you know, with a, with a curved bench top and also, um, I'll show you a couple. Does a curved bench top look all right in the L-shaped kitchen? Got well, it just depends on when you say, how would you be, like, what, how would you be, what would you be doing? It just depends on where you, your, 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 your island bench is always going to line up with one, one row of cabinetry. So, I mean, I'm just, See if I've got. I don't, maybe I haven't included an image um, of a rounded bench top. Um, this kitchen here has a rounded bench top. One this. What profile is this? That's a poly. That was a Polytech custom profile. But so you, they. Um, I don't even. I don't think they're actually doing that one anymore. But they've got other options that are very similar, which is like a scalloped sort of profile. And you can also so. That's the thermo laminated range from Polytech. But you can also get have any any profile routed out and then two packed as well. So, you know, anything that you can imagine. Um, so this kitchen, I can't. So Polytech is like Laminex. They put they're actually the manufacturer or the supplier of um, laminates. So, you know, all the coloured board. Yeah, so your cabinet maker will buy their board and you'll choose a colour. For your kitchen from then if you're not using two packs. So you can see there's a curve there. Um, I don't know if that answers that question. Um, so there's a curve there. And I'm not sure if that's an L shaped kitchen or you know, maybe you sort of got the cabinetry, but I think we're talking about a different style kitchen where it's more open and you just sort of. <laughs> um, it just depends. Yeah, sure. I've used both. Um, I prefer to live with a manufactured product. Thank you, pleasure. Um, I prefer to um, live with a manufactured product because it's just bulletproof. It's easy. This is actually porcelain. It's not. Um, it's not. Um, you know, you um, reconstituted. Um, normal rubber the mill stone and it's much tougher and much like it's an amazing surface but it is more expensive so you know it doesn't stain it's so easy to clean and I feel like it's stronger in terms of chips and things like that because you know stone does chip um, but you know if, if you're prepared to do to be careful otherwise I save those sort of products for like I'm doing some built-in cabinetry in the living room or something that's really nice but you're not going to have your red wine. red wine. Yeah, exactly. And your um, lime and lemon juice and everything else, you know. Um, but yeah, I think um, uh, it's just a personal preference of what you're, what you're willing to live with, really, and the colour. <laughs> sure, sure. The first one is asking the white brown speakers. Yes, they're lights. They're wall lights. Yeah, they're from um, Unios Light. Uh, from basically, you purchase them from lights, lights, lights .com .au. Um, Yeah, they're beautiful. And they're also, you can use those, they're external lights. So you can use them externally or internally. And they, they, they actually glow, they backlight whatever you set them on. So that's if you can see it's a textured tile that's got like tiny little, tiny miniature little hexagons. Yeah. Yeah. So that lights that up, but then also the internal circle lights up as well. It's really beautiful soft lighting. And then I've got another question. Um, for wall facing benches, is the depth of the bench more prominently deeper than 
Sure. So 600 mil is basically your standard bench top depth. I always go about 620. Just gives you that little bit more room, especially if you've got, like if you've got your um, basically uh, cooktop and then you've got just a wall, then you want to go 620. You've just got that bit more distance. Your cooktop isn't sitting almost hard up against the back wall. So there's no... Yeah. And I mean, that's not as much of an issue, but it's more just the cooktop depth. So you're not right there and you've got that you know heat so if you're having a kitchen made by a kitchen um company generally anything that you want so it's more that you look at the plans when they send them to you and go okay we want we, you know make sure we just have an extra 10 20 mil it's like two three centimeters and it's just a bit of extra storage yeah and i mean here we're actually running into a window i mean that would be about 6 30 anyway but then when you run into a window like that you actually gain a little bit more as well so there's a lot more distance there between the cooktop um, and the window, the glass flashback. So, <laughs> that's actually under mount. So that's underneath. But you could with with those style sinks. Um, I don't know if you've seen. It's sort of like a farmhouse style sink almost. Where and you often often with those sinks, really in the kitchen, they usually have no stone at the front. They're usually just integrated or they just spun up on three sides and the front's sort of open. So it's like in, in bathrooms, inset basins are much more popular. Um, so, but yeah, in kitchens, so that's an undermount. So that's stuck up underneath, the, the top is polished. And so you can imagine everything just wipes straight in. It's just like, you know, to the left of that is the dishwasher and to the right is the bin. And you can then, wipe, you open the bin and you can wipe things straight in. Less work. Is there more um, possibility though of chipping the stone on the top? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. So it is. Like so to build it and then rent it out in the future. Well, like yeah, I mean, but anything you can chip anything. You can chip a tile on the floor. That's porcelain. If you dropped something, you know. Um, but it is. It, if it's something like if you if you've got two sinks, like in my home, I've got my island bench where I've got a sink, and then in my scullery, I've got a drop-in sink because it, you know. That's where all the washing gets done everywhere. Anyway, the other one's more, we fill it up with ice and put a bottle of champagne in there. It doesn't get used very often. Um, so, you know, you, you really, but you do, you, if, you, if, you're some, if you've got lots of pots and you're a big cook, you might consider dropping in, dropping it in or what surface you use, like using a really hard surface. These, um, these are um, quantum quartz um, alpine white bench tops. Um, in the other home we had, um, these are porcelain bench tops. I think porcelain, I'm not sure, I can't, I don't know the statistics, but I feel like porcelain feels really strong. Um, but it's more expensive. And I mean, I've got, I've got, um, I've got quantum quartz bench tops in my kitchen at home. And I do have a few little chips, but it's seven years old. And you can get them refilled. It's like, you know, you, you'll chip a wall, you'll do things like that. So it's really a matter of, you know, what, um, what you're prepared to live with and what you want and also your budget you know you want to stretch your budget as far as you can so actually what i was talking i was going to show you as well with the question about island benches and um and whether you do a waterfall if you aren't doing a waterfall you can also consider doing storage at the end and finishing your um to do a feature and then you don't feel like you necessarily are missing a waterfall it's right at the beginning oops Oh, it doesn't want to show me. This one. So you can see there, there's no waterfall on the side mm. and there's, um, and, and so you've got the cabinetry there, so then that makes that more of a feature. Um, so, you know, you don't have to have waterfalls. There's no rules. It's, and, and more comes down to your, just like what you want your kitchen to look like and what you want the finish to be like. And obviously then you've got stone on the side so that can get chips. Chips, so can laminate, so, yeah. Distance between um, the cooktop bench and the island bench, yeah. ideally should be 12 feet. Yeah. But what's the minimum that you can go? I don't like going below 1100. It just depends on the kitchen. You just got to, you've got to think about when you're in your kitchen, if you've got two, if you've got one person, it's not such a big deal. But as soon as you've got two people in the kitchen and you've got someone behind you opening a fridge, you just don't have that room. So it's, it's about appliances and opening, 
you know, where someone's standing and opening appliance and things like that. That kitchen has 1,500 mil between um, the island bench and the um, cooktop because it's got the seating and that's like a real, you know, dining space in that space. So, and you know, and that's a large home, so it, it works for that home. But, you know, another home, a smaller home, you wouldn't have 1,500, the island bench would feel like it's not in the kitchen. So, and ideally with the island bench, you want to make sure it's within your kitchen footprint as well. It's not out, it doesn't come out, unless you're really restricted, um, always try. And if you've got the return, to make sure it's sitting within that space, so it feels like it's in the kitchen and not coming out into a hallway. So that's just some, like another little thing to consider when you're doing your I'm sorry, I couldn't hear before when you said about the um, stove in that one where it opened and it was on the end. Like what does, you know where well, the door went down? Like, I oh, know, no, so what I was saying was... Um, so you have to dip a stove in and out, the island bench in? Well, you want to have at least 1,200 mil generally. Okay. But you could go down to 1,100 okay. um, or 1,150, anywhere between. It's still functional. 1,200 is great. 1,200 feels really big. But, you know, 11 to 1,150 is good as well. And if you're not sure and, you know, you've got the, you're in your kitchen or you're at home, just mask it out. Put a, put a bedside table there and put something else and walk around and go, you know, that's a really good place. Off against the wall, put something there, put furniture and walk around and see how it feels. It's more about putting that. It's, it's, about, it's about having the space for two people to be in a kitchen or, you know, some, if you imagine you're at the sink, someone's behind you, they're opening the oven or they're just even walking past you. You know, if you take a step back, you don't want to be... In that other kitchen, it's kind of, um, I've never seen an island bench go down and the end of it have a stove at it. Um, so there was there's a distance there of 1100. 1100. Yeah, but if you think about is that a good idea? well, 1100 is okay if the, in that kitchen because you're not usually standing on the end. So as well, so you're thinking with the, that distance, if you've got people areas that are ba working areas that are basically opposite each other. So if you don't have a working area, then it's not as much of an issue, and you could even maybe go down to a meter fifty or something if you stuck to space. Um, um, years ago, it used to be the preference was uh, um, wall ovens. Nowadays, it seems to be a lot of under bench ovens. So, what's what's your opinion on, on those two things? I love a wall oven. Um, that's actually my kitchen, and I've got a wall oven. I've actually got another oven under my cooktop. Um, so, I def I'm wall oven every day of the week because I just don't like reaching down. But I put um, under bench ovens in a lot because we're in a smaller kitchen. It's practical because you've, you've got more bench top because obviously when you put a wall oven in, then you've got more of a wall and you can still put storage in above and below, but you know, you really um, generally, definitely um, for functionality, I think a wall oven is awesome. I don't actually use that other oven very often. Our <laughs> wall oven at home is um, put that in my 78 and because I'm an electrician, I've always wanted to keep it going. It's a big, but this wide, just reach there, double oven and the top, the, the Main door, it actually opens up like that. Oh, wow. And it opens up just a piece, yeah, like in front of all the controls. So it just, so it doesn't come down like that at all. That's fantastic. It is fantastic. I don't know if you'll be able to replace one of the same size. I don't know if they're still yeah, making yeah, those. If I could buy a new one, is it? It still looks fantastic. And it still works perfectly. Yeah. Um, Should you cook tops in the oven? Um, they don't have to be because you're not necessarily using them at the same time. So I've got a cooktop underneath. I've got an oven underneath. You can have wall ovens and then your cooktop and have all um, cabinetry underneath. So they don't need to be right next to each other. They are you know, two separate areas and you're not using anything that you're using at the same time you're going between the two, you want close together. I mean, they're usually, you want, usually they look good if they're close, you know, in a kitchen. It sort of feels right to, to not have your oven all the way. But I mean, that, you know, then it's not necessarily a, a organised or functional kitchen anyway if you've got things so far apart. Mm -hmm. So... How much space It's a really good question. There's no ideal, but I think a minimum of 600, I think, because 600 is sort of like, that's probably about 600, so you can actually do something there. If you have to um, have your um, cooktop right close to a wall, then I'd allow at least two or 300 so you can put something down. But Ideally, you know, I mean, bench top next to your cooktop is pretty important because if you're prepping, I think it's nice to prep. I do a lot of prep next to my cooktop and, you know, 
even though you've got other areas in your kitchen, it just seems to work really well. Or your, your um, um, I'd go maybe seven. Yeah, but six hundred's fine. Like, and you don't, and you don't. If you've got a, an oven underneath, they don't need to be the same size either. It doesn't matter. Like, that's a there's a nine hundred cooktop. I've got a six hundred oven underneath. Um, you know, save your money and buy a really beautiful self cleaning oven because they're amazing. Um, and you literally never have to clean your oven. They actually work self cleaning ovens. Um, so, but yes, a seven hundred's a really nice compromise because it really gives you almost an the functionality of a 900 but in a small space and then you've got that extra bench top which you know that's a lot of bench top um to gain so yes. sure avoid corner cabinetry no <laughs> it is it, you know if you can avoid corner cabinetry it's good um but you know we always have corner cabinetry um so that's where storage solutions come in really handy because there's there's so many and they're really good these days like if you go like i've used headache for almost 15 years in all my kitchens and i've never had to replace anything that's not to say nothing will ever need to be replaced but the stuff just works like it's made properly so you know you use a drawer 10 years later the drawer still works um and you know all those sorts of um solutions for in but they're the best solutions for a corner cabinet and then up the top same or you can do a corner open shelf possibly um, because obviously it's harder to reach and pull something out and be able to access it so if you're going to do some open shelving that might be a good solution up high um, was there was that just a, a, on a small budget yeah and, and just you know, storage space on a tight budget storage space obviously I think a pull out pantry is a really good solution like a good quality pull out pantry I mean it's hard because we have a limited budget for our kitchen, but it's really not the place to save money in your home. Like I'd always, I'd always um, maximize it as much as I could and do it all properly and then do something else. Like if you're building a home and people like, you know, we all do integrated cabinetry everywhere. I would just put the TV unit in later and I do the kitchen properly and not have compromises everywhere. So, I mean, you can go two years down the track and do get a whole lot of other stuff put in, but you know, do do the space properly so it's really functional. So you're not, you know, you haven't really solved any problems. It's not a great space to use. Um, you know, make sure, and that comes down to not only money, but also design, just making sure you've got enough of the right storage solutions. And one thing I didn't really talk about for bench top, bench top is the storage solution. That's actually really important. You've got enough space to prepare, to, you know, put out plates, to platters, things like that. So, you know, that's, as important as all your other storage solutions in your kitchen. I have my own question. Sure. Because, uh, we also think about doing the thin item each. Yeah. Could you do, I mean, um, yeah, so you have the one the other side with the thin velocity. Yeah. Would you also have uh, opening cabinets? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Definitely. So that those cupboards open there at the back. You can see some little tap handles, maybe. Um, so, yeah, you can. So that's, you need, it's basically it's about 300 mil deep that you, and that's, as far without um, without using a substrate for your stone to hold it up. So like in the island bench, I had a whole steel frame made and then the stone was wrapped around it. So, because obviously it just, there's no end to it and you know, it can take a lot of weight because it's steel basically. So, but there's yeah, the back of the cupboards and just make sure you put handles on those cupboards. Don't put um, like push catches or anything like that yeah, yeah, yeah. because you know, you'll sit down and open the cupboard door. That's right. I did that once. Yes. <laughs> long, long time ago. So, so you said that bench is that's fifteen hundred or is it? So the bench is twelve hundred, oh, and then I, there's fifteen hundred mil okay. between the cook top and then the island bench. And also, um, I know it's personal preference, but okay, is it induction cook tops now or the normal ones or gas? Or yep. So definitely uh, personal preference, but I, I I've got an induction cook top. I love induction. Um, it's just easy to clean. Like, so if you've ever used a ceramic cooktop, what do I hate about the ceramic cooktop? Burn it's marks. burn marks. You don't get that with induction. Mm -hmm. And also, um, so cleaning and um, the heating, you know, it takes a long time to heat. Mm -hmm. Induction cooktops heat really quickly. But if you love gas, I mean, people love gas, just go for gas. 
And if you've got natural gas as well, if you've got supply, it's easier. But if you've got a gas bottle, you know, especially with smaller footprints in our homes, we've also got smaller yards, we've got smaller spaces to put all the stuff that needs to go, all the utility, like, you know, your air conditioning and clothesline and everything else. So, you know, you don't have to have that gas bottle. It's just electric's pretty easy, always, well, mostly on tap. Um, so, yeah. Two pack, or laminate? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> two pack or laminate? Um, just depends. I always use two pack if budget allows because I just think it's a much nicer finish. But then I always use like that's a laminate kitchen for the for the timber grain, and then I've got two pack for the other cupboard. So you can mix them up. I mean, laminate is definitely harder wearing. There's no two ways about it. Um, you know, it's almost bulletproof. I had my kids write riding around on scooters when they were smaller in my kitchen. It's, it's just, there's no dings in it. But then the two pack also can be very um, hard wearing, but it's all about making sure you've got a quality um, two pack applied because it's basically a paint finish that's applied to you. Your cabinet maker will make the cabinetry to your size and it'll be sent off and two packed or the paint will be applied. So if you've got a quality cabinet maker, your two pack, like that two pack's seven years old, it's got a couple of it hasn't even chipped. It's more like a little ding where someone's, you know, hit it. I think I've got more wear and tear on my bench top than I have on my two pack. So it's all about quality. But yeah, it, it does come with a price tag. So you know, choose, you know, where you put it. And um, yep. But if you've got the budget. It is really nice. <laughs> so, so did you say that you would rather put a handle uh, for if you've got cabinetry at the back yeah. rather than the push catch? Because with a push catch, when you apply pressure to it, it opens up. Yeah. So, so if you sit down, I think my first kitchen shows my age, but it was about 15 years ago. I was like, no handles, sat down, went, oh, okay, that was dumb. <laughs> so, you know, definitely put little handles um, or finger pull. Yeah, you can do finger pulls, but, you know, depending if you've only got a shallow, shallow line that's 16 mil, you'd have to come down a little bit lower, but like a tiny little tab handle, it's storage that you don't use very often usually. It just gets, you know, it's extra stuff. So a little tab handle is enough. But yeah, you can definitely use a finger pull as well, but you'll just need a 25 mil shadow line, like a bit more just to get your hand in and open it up. So, so how do you open those top cupboards? Are they the underneath. Oh, okay. Underneath. And that's actually, I mean, it's cheap. Like a push catch is an expensive hardware. You know, that's one of the, um, that's some of the hardware that you can get from Headache. So, um, that's where you push something to open it and then you push it to close. They're a finger pull, so they're basically, if you've got the underside of your cupboard, you've got a channel and then you've got the door in front of it, so you just put your hand in and pull it open. So it's underneath it's flush except for the channel. So... 700 or 600 overhead cupboards? In terms of the height to yeah, them? From the bench to the underside. I always go at least 650, but it depends on your um, cooktop that you're using. Because if you've got gas, it's, there's a minimum distance from your flame to the um, underside of your overheads. I think it, matters, it depends on your ceiling height as well. I think there I've got, I, I've got 600. You know, I don't have a lot there. Um, and I've got 2.7 ceilings plus a bulkhead. It's all about, I mean, I, when I look at a kitchen, I draw it and then I look at it and I make sure it looks balanced. So, um, and your cabinet maker will usually give you a drawing and just have a look. Um, you know, the higher you go, you can go floor to ceiling. Um, can you actually reach into those top covers? Oh, absolutely not. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I live in Queensland. I've usually got no shoes on. Yeah. Um, no, but you know, they're, they're just storage of extra things. So, you know, things that you don't use, things that come out at Christmas or candles or, you know, it's extra storage. And if you've got, if you've got extra, like the, you can never have too much storage in a home, although you will fill it. Well, it just depends on the look. We had a bulkhead there because we need to run, you know, something in underneath um, air conditioning and plumbing. But um, here you've got no bulkhead, and it's beautiful, and it goes to the thing, and you do have to get up on a ladder to access that stuff. But it's better than having what I did once, like put a gap. Yeah, oh, dust yeah. collector. Yeah. You integrated a dust collector. Yeah, but that's what all kitchens are like that. And it was, you know, it was cost yeah. as well. It's cheaper. So, um, yeah, there's, 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 and you know, it, it once again comes down to, it might come down to your home that you have at the moment. So what works 
with it. You, you might have to have a bulkhead or you might have a design where, you know, there needs to be something structural. So you have to have a bulkhead or you might be able to go to, like, it obviously looks nicer, and but it is more expensive because, you, like, especially, you know, this kitchen's got 2.7 ceilings. So you need two cabinet makers to come in and bring that in. You, you, your cabinetry is shorter because, you know, the shadow line goes in at the end, but you come in and it can scrape this, like it's a big piece of it. So it might cost twice as much to install that. So it is the cost that you can save. So the shadow, see how the bench has a line, you've got the bench top. Um, no, so the, so the the actual bench top on the island bench, yeah. and then you see there's a line below it, yeah. and then there's the panel. Yeah. That line, that horizontal line is the shadow line. Oh. Yeah, so it just, it's, Aesthetic. If you've got a, um, a kitchen with finger pulls, obviously that's where your finger pull. That can, will also be your finger pull. But I always like if you've ever seen uh, driven past a house and it's just like a big flat wall at the front, and it just you need depth on anything to make it interesting. Um, a shadow line. A shadow line. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like basically, you know, it, it's basically a depth adding depth to your cabinetry and also. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my laptop. Um, but basically, it also, um, what's up, my train of thought? I'll go back to that for anyone who's still with us. Number five. Five. You can see it on it, and then you can do it at the top with the shadow. Yep. Otherwise, yep. you'll never stand up there. Well, actually, that's, that's not a shadow line. That's just, that, just because of the angle of the light. It's actually just where the bottom cupboard on the top cupboard, the separation, because you've you've got a door at the bottom and then you've got another door at the top. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I mean the very top there. oh yeah, sorry, the top, so yes, the top has a shadow I line too. Well, that's right. And it's also because really your, um, your ceiling will not necessarily be plumb. So they'll take that shadow line and they can, you know, even if you've got an amazing builder, it might be two or three mils out, mil out, so they'll shade that down. And that's what I was gonna say with the shadow line, a shadow line also allows you to have that look where your bench top and your um, cabinetry pretty much line up, have that look without them sitting one on top of the other. So, so yeah, let me just say, if you have an amazing builder, why can't you do this one? Oh, I said, even if you've got an amazing builder, you still, you know, things will be out a little bit because it just takes the jib rock to be pushed up a little bit higher, you know. Um, you know, nothing's ever square and kitchens aren't square either. So shadow lines are, one of the ways we hide things and we make everything look square and perfect, you know, and it, it might 